got your Bible this morning, turn with me to the first chapter of Luke. This morning we're going to read verses 5 through 25 of that chapter. We'll read it together in just a moment. Before we read that together, I want to tell you all about a scene from one of my favorite movies, Field of Dreams. There's a scene when the main character of that movie, Ray Kinsella, is given a message that he needs to go and find a man named Archibald Moonlight Graham. Seeks him out, finds this Moonlight Graham. He's a small town doctor, aging almost to retirement age. And he seeks him out, and he's not even exactly sure what he's supposed to learn. From this man so we kind of get some biographical information to see what he can learn from this man with the nickname moonlight and in doing so learns that dr graham prior to becoming a medical doctor was a ball player for a few years not a particularly successful one toiled in the minors for year after year after year until finally finally the time came with just Three weeks before the end of the season, he was called up to the majors. Didn't see much action in those three weeks, but on the very last day of the season, the manager turned, pointed, said, Graham, right field. And he was put in as a defensive replacement, and for the first time, and as it would turn out the last time, he ran out to the outfield and he played in a Major League Baseball game. Ball never made it out of the infield, and he never got a chance to step up to the plate. But at least for that moment, he stepped on the field. After that happened, he decided in the offseason he couldn't stomach another year of minor league baseball and couldn't handle the prospect that he might never be called up again. And so he retired and started a new life, became a doctor. But when the main character of this movie seeks out Moonlight Graham and learns all of this information, learns about Dr. Graham's career path and about his brief stint in the major leagues, he asks him a question. He asks, do you have a wish? Is there anything you wish for about that time playing baseball? And this is how Dr. Archibald and Moonlight Graham responds. Well, you know, I, I never got to bat in the major leagues. I'd have liked to have just had that chance just once to stare down a big league pitcher, to stare him down then just as he goes into his windup, make him think you know something he doesn't. That's what I wish for. The chance to squint at a sky so blue that it hurts your eyes just to look at it. To feel the tingle in your arms as you connect with the ball. To run the bases, stretch a double into a triple, and flop face first into third. Wrap your arms around the bag. That's my wish, Ray Kinsella. That's my wish. Now that feeling that he describes there, that feeling is, in a larger sense, not the particulars of what he's wishing for, but the larger sense, that is everyone's wish. In a workaday world, we are looking for moments. Moments when dreams become reality. Moments when the seriousness and the import of what is happening heightens every sense we have. Moments of transcendence. Now, few of us are so greedy as to think that life can be like that all of the time. But like Moonlight Graham, we just want one chance. Just a glimpse of the glorious. In the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, we bear witness to a series 
of such moments. Glimpses of the glorious, moments of transcendence. An angel appears in a girl's living room. A carpenter is given divine messages in his dreams. The quiet of a Bethlehem sky is pierced by the sound of the heavenly host. And ultimately, as a little Jewish baby enters the world with a cry and is laid in a manger bed, the very word of God becomes flesh and lives among us. In these stories that we read over the next month, we bear witness not to an absent, distant God who refuses to get his hands dirty. No, no, we see through the eyes of Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, wise men from the east, we see through their eyes these glimpses of glory, these moments in which the otherworldly reaches out to the worldly, when the consecrated comes to the commonplace, these moments when just for a second, heaven touches earth. Now for those who, like Moonlight Graham, wish for a glimpse of the glorious those who need to know that god has not left us alone in this world advent brings a reminder each and every year a reminder that god does not abandon us to a world of hopelessness hostility heartache and hatred god is with us so let's read the first of these infancy narratives. This morning you'll see we're not even getting to Jesus quite yet. There's two infants born in these chapters. So follow along. Let me read from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And let's see the hope of this passage. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the eyes, to me, to turn the hearts of parents to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <coughs> Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe these words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he realized he could not speak to them, and they realized that he'd seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me 
and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This passage begins the story of John the Baptist, he who would prepare the way for Jesus. He who, just as Gabriel said, would turn the hearts of the people, would preach a message of repentance, would tell God's people that they needed to turn from wickedness to God because Messiah was coming. And it's in this story that we see the beginning of that narrative play out. And it's amazing at the beginning of that story. It's amazing how with so few words, Luke manages to present such a bleak picture of what God's people's lives were like at that time. It starts in a way that you probably didn't even notice, really. In the days of King Herod of Judea, when you read that, that seems pretty innocuous. It's just setting the scene. It's just telling you when this happened. But it's a little more than that. Because I think you would agree with me that if I say in the 1930s, that has a different connotation than if I say in the days of the Great Depression. Or if I say in the days of Hitler's rise to power. It means the same thing. But one is simply a date, just facts and figures. The other evokes what's happening at the time. The other evokes current events. The other paints a picture. Same thing here, because Herod the Great, this king of Judea, evoked pretty strong feelings for those first reading Luke's gospel. For nearly a hundred years, there had been a time between the exile and the writing here, when the Jews had ruled themselves once again in Judea. They'd come back from exile and thought, here's our chance. Once again, we can establish our promised land. Once again, God will be with us and restore us to greatness. And for about a hundred years, they ruled themselves. And then in came the big bad Roman Empire. And when the Romans conquered, this very same Herod was installed as king over them. He wasn't a very nice king. He was a tyrant. Used secret police, violently put down protests, all the things that tyrants have done throughout history. Herod was a symbol for the people of oppression. And it's in this context, in the days of this king that Luke introduces us to our characters, to Zechariah and to Elizabeth. He establishes their credentials from the get-go. Zechariah is a priest, part of the eighth of 24 divisions of priests. And furthermore, Elizabeth is the descendant of the priest, Aaron, Moses' right-hand man. Both of these two, Zechariah and Elizabeth, are righteous, we're told, that they live blamelessly. Luke wants us to know from the outset that these two, in terms of holiness, they've got it together. They've got the lineage, they've got the pedigree, and they've got the actions to go with it. They're given the same descriptor that Noah and Job were. They live righteously, they live blamelessly. They have it together. Except that they don't. Because their credentials aren't the only part of their story that Luke tells us tells us that they have no children and then as if to twist the knife no. that they're not getting any younger for a man in those days that was a problem a financial problem in particular no heir to whom to give your worldly possessions your property and the rest for a woman in those days that was a problem a social problem Barrenness was seen as a curse from God. The inability to bear children was seen as not only something sad, but as a sign of sin, as a sign of brokenness. For Zachariah, it was a financial problem. For Elizabeth, it was a social problem. And for the two of them together, 
we have to assume it was an emotional problem. For these two, who like all Jewish couples, wanted to be a father and a mother, wanted to start their own lineage, only to find that they couldn't. There is just not a lot of hope to be found in the first three verses of this passage. At the macro level, big picture level, you got this political oppression by Herod. At the micro level, you've got this intimate devastation of childlessness. And you'll notice one more thing from those three verses. God is nowhere to be found. His people here are faithful, it seems, but for generations, no prophetic messages, no miracles, no Messiah. The world of Luke 1, 5 through 7, feels pretty hopeless. And too often, our world today feels the same way, feels hopeless. Luke gives us the macro level, so let me do the same. We are living in an age of dread. 60% of people in our country think that things are going in the wrong direction. This in spite of the best economy since I was a child. Life expectancy in our country has declined three years in a row. Last time that happened was the 19-teens when World War I was happening and a flu epidemic was happening. And while it's always hard to quantify who believes in God and what that means exactly, that's always a tricky poll question, nevertheless, there's no question that churches and denominational structures, the things we can point to, the things we can have data for, these are certainly on the decline. That's the macro level. And at the micro level, Zachariah and Elizabeth, they're long gone. But faithful people still see their faith rewarded, it seems, with nothing but suffering. Childlessness, sickness, abuse, natural disasters, families falling apart. <laughs> on and on the list goes. You can probably think of someone in your own life who loves the Lord, who's faithful to him, who tries to do their best for God each and every day, and it seems like they just can't catch a break. And when you see faithful people suffer like this, when you suffer like this, it becomes really difficult not to see the world as a hopeless, godless place. But into this vacuum that sucks up hope, into this vacuum, God steps into the picture. In the story, Zechariah goes into work for what's going to be the biggest day of his career. Priests in those days typically got one chance in a lifetime to light the incense in the morning and the evening. This was a special duty, and with the number of priests in the land, you only got to do it one time. It was decided by lot, and you were only going to get one chance. And today is his day. He gets to enter the sanctuary, light the incense, begin to worship. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but he gets even more than he bargained for. Because when he steps into the sanctuary, before him is not just candles, not just incense, but an angel of the Lord. An angel with a message. Hope is coming. One was coming, the angel said, who was going to turn the hearts of the people back to God. One who was going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Soon enough, no one was going to be saying, Herod is Lord, but rather, Christ is Lord. And this prophet, this one who would prepare the way for the Christ, this prophet in the wilderness, this new Elijah, was going to be Zachariah's son, Elizabeth's child. They were going to be parents at last. This is the message that the angel brings. 
But what jumps off the page more than anything to me is the words of verse 19. Listen to these words again. It's after Zechariah questions how this could possibly be. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. The rest of the story is really just falling action. It's really just resolution, fulfillment. This is the climax. I, an angel of the Lord, I, Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to you to bring you good news. I read a story this week about a woman named Thelma in Columbus, Ohio, 96 years old, called the police because her door was not working, wouldn't open and close properly. And at 96 years old, she didn't really know what else to do. She called the police. They came out. They fixed the door pretty easily. And while they were there, she just sort of casually mentioned that she really appreciated their help, but it was actually her birthday today. Police officers left and had an idea. They went to a Kroger, picked up a birthday cake, brought it back to her. It's the words she said that stick with me when I think about Advent, when I think about hope, when I think about God with us. They brought this cake to this 96-year-old woman they'd just met that day. And when she received it, she said, I didn't think anybody cared. In a world so dominated by dread, we all feel that way sometimes. We don't think anybody really cares. We don't think our problems rise up to the level of anyone taking much of an interest, much less the God of the cosmos. I didn't think anybody cared. Advent, this season we are in now, Advent, starting with Zechariah and Joseph, moving to Mary and Joseph, moving to the shepherds in the field, it is our annual reminder. God has not left us alone in this world. God cares. God is with us. And for you and I this morning, there is tremendous hope in that. As you walk through a world that is often so hopeless, as you walk through a world filled with dread, I hope you will remember this story. I hope you will remember that for a moment, and then another, and then another, and then another, heaven touched earth. That ultimately the word became flesh and lived among us. That God is with us, even today. God cares. God loves you. God is with you. In a world of dread, may that be your hope. Is that? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. For all of these moments which we'll look at over the next month, these moments when the otherworldly reached out to the worldly, when heaven touched earth, these stories of angels and messages and dreams, these stories of ordinary people and ordinary places suddenly being transformed before the eyes of those who witnessed it. I thank you for these continual reminders of how you work through ordinary people in ordinary times, in ordinary places. How you care about such people. 
how you love such people. Lord, in this season of Advent especially, I pray that we would cling to the promise, cling to the hope that you are with us in our highs and our lows, that you are with us when we are righteous and that you are with us when we sin, that you forgive us our debts and that you restore us and sanctify us. Lord, may hopelessness not cloud the truth. You are with us. In Jesus' name that I pray. In just a second, we're going to...